Recently, when visiting the Virginia State House, that's a Capitol building for those that don't know, I had the opportunity to see the only statue of George Washington for which he actually sat for the sculptor to take his likeness. And while there, a guide took some school children around and told them a story that's familiar to historians but forgotten by many. At the end of the Revolutionary War, Washington was the hero of the people, the one leader that was recognized throughout the colonies, and the man who had complete control over the military. Now, for most people, that would have been a dream position. He had more power than most of the rulers in Europe. There was no one to oppose him, and many of the people wanted him to be king. However, that's not what was on Washington's mind. When the artist Benjamin West told King George III that Washington planned to resign, the king replied, If he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. And yet that is exactly what Washington did. In a ceremony arranged by consultation with the Continental Congress on December 23rd, 1783, Washington gave up all of his power. His resignation speech was only six paragraphs long. The last two I want to read to you because they show the character that George III found so astounding. Washington said, I consider it an indispensable duty to close this last solemn act of my official life by commending the interests of my dearest country to the protection of Almighty God and those who have the superintendence of them to His holy keeping. Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have long acted, I have here offered my commission and take my leave of all employments of public life. When he finished making that speech, the members rose from their seats, removed their hats as Washington left the chamber and headed to Mount Vernon. The allure of the throne had no appeal to George Washington. And that is one of the things that made him so different and so special. But this is reminiscent of another similar situation that you find in Judges chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Gideon had defeated the Midianites... And immediately after this, the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also. Become king, in other words. Set up a dynasty. For you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Oh, that Israel would have heeded Gideon's words. But the fact is that the story of the Old Testament and the story of life has always centered on this simple question. And it needs to be posed to each one of us here tonight. Who's going to be on the throne? Oh, we think, well, we live in America. What are you talking? No, someone is in charge of your life. Men have placed everyone conceivable on that throne. But it is the place where God alone should reign. So let us consider then through the history now of the Old Testament. And notice how this played out and the lessons we can learn. The first thing I want you to note is the seduction of the throne has provoked many worldly aspirations. It's the nature of it. Before Israel crossed into Canaan, Moses specifically warned the people about wanting a king. And he used this language as when you get into this land, you're going to want a king like the other nations. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14. 
He told them that's what you're going to want to do. And guess what? That's exactly what they did. The throne is seductive because it symbolizes power and authority. And there are so many people that like the idea of power and authority that you can always find someone that's going to be willing to do it, take over, and they'll take control and rule. Shortly after Noah's flood, Nimrod, Ham's grandson, began to consolidate power and he built for himself a kingdom, it says, throughout Mesopotamia in Genesis chapter 10, 8 through 12. Not, I mean, right after the flood. Indeed, this very well could have been what led to the building of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Let's prove how powerful and mighty and great we are. Look at us. We have power. In the time of the judges just mentioned, Gideon's son, and this was an illegitimate son, Abimelech, he expressed his desire to reign. Hey, will you all let me reign over you? What? Yeah, I'd like to reign. And both his half-brothers, not Gideon's sons, and the men of Shechem went along with him in it, as you read in chapter 9 and verse 6. And that led the one son that got away from all of his half-brothers, Jotham, to then go to the people and give a parable in which he ultimately compares Abimelech to a bramble bush. Oh, all the great trees. They said, no, 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 we don't want to rule. But you got a bramble? Yeah, a bramble will take it. And that led to a civil war in Israel in which Abimelech ultimately died in judgment, it says, for his presumption to take that role on himself. So by the time then you move through Judges and you get to Samuel, we find that even the leaders now in the various tribes had given in to this type of thinking. Individuals taking power, a few people kind of green to go along, but now it's everybody. Yeah, that's what we need. It'll solve all of our problems. And so they asked for a king like all the nations in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4-9. through 9. Why? It says they did so because, verse 12, they feared Nahash, king of the Ammonites. It's amazing what you will do in handing away your authority and giving your power to somebody when you're afraid. And now you have to think, why were they afraid? It's because no one was on the throne in their lives. That phrase, like all the nation, that's a key that so many forget. People tend to think that they can have what the world has and be like the world without suffering the consequences that the world suffers. You can't have one without the other. If you're going to go be like the world, you get the world's judgment. We tend to think that things are so different today. Well, yeah, back then, all those, those old people, and they weren't that bright. I mean, that's kind of how it's portrayed today. The underlying problems are exactly the same, so let's consider. People today, and including far too many Christians, spend their time trying to consolidate power instead of submitting to God's authority. We go and try to figure out if we can't get our own little kingdom, doesn't matter what it is, how big it is, if I can just get a few people to think I'm great and powerful, they'll listen to me, then that's my goal. If I can just get my little club of people to think I'm great, same principle. 1 Peter chapter 5 or 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due time. You see, what well, the problem is, is we all want someone to exalt us. We want to be exalted, put up on that pedestal. God will do that when the time is right. Humility comes first. And if we don't, we think, well, now wait a minute, that's not life. Go back and read Philippians chapter 2 in which it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a matter, in the manner of life of a man, he says, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9, Therefore God hath also highly exalted him. Which came first? Humility. What did it take? Complete obedience. How did it end? Death for God. What happened after that? 
exalted. We flip things around and we want to be exalted now and think we'll be humble later. We'll be humbled later if we do it that way, but not humble. Because of selfish ambition, people would rather divide and conquer in the church than unify and build up. Because now I get my own little territory. We'll just carve up the church that is Christ so we can get our portion of it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Notice how those went together. Look at who I am and what I can do. But let each esteem others better than themselves. It means to consider and lift up above. If we were all more interested in exalting Christ and putting our brethren before ourselves, we wouldn't have near the problem of division. But when men want to exalt themselves you end up with far more division because we have to have it our way. We need to get to where we want it done Christ's way and drop the my ways out of this. Out of fear for the future, whether due to falling numbers maybe, cultural decline, all of a sudden it becomes acceptable to compromise. Well, you know, we don't want to run those people off. We don't have that many people here as it is. So you think that the more sinners still in sin, influencing other people to sin, we get in the church, the better the church is going to be? That's brilliant. And yet people do it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Fear not him who is able to destroy both body, or body, but is not able to destroy the soul, but fear whom is able to destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Make sure you got your respect properly focused on what matters. You see, we can get into this game where well, we can't offend the greatest giver in the congregation. And that means we've forgotten that we're offending the great God who makes the congregation go. Most of all, far too often people get their ideas of how to work in the kingdom by looking over to the world. Well, you know, they're doing this down the road. You don't look to the world to find out what you do for the church. You look to the word to see what you do for the church. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You want to know what God wants? You want to know what God works for God? It's going to be found in His word. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12 verse 2. Now think about it. You want to find what's acceptable? It's in here. You want to find what sanctifies? It's going to be in here. You want to see what God approves of? It's going to be in here. And the fact that we spend our time looking around at everybody else says we're not spending enough of our time in here. All of this comes from trying to assume authority for ourselves or maybe a friend down the road. But here's the thing. Brethren, it doesn't matter what you think, what I think, what you believe, what I believe, what you feel, what I feel. What matters is what God says. Because in John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one to judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that last day. You're not going to be judged based upon what you believe, what you feel, or what your opinion is. You're going to be judged based upon what Jesus taught. Worldly aspirations produce worldly thinking, which leads to worldly problems. And Israel's history demonstrates that thoroughly. Second of all, the history of the throne has focused on men, not their maker. And that's why it creates a problem. Saul, King Saul, he thought there was no reason why he shouldn't be able to alter God's plan ever so slightly. You know, details, details. That's an interesting cry. We just need to get back. We got the basics down. Why are you worried about the details? Saul got in trouble and lost the kingdom because he failed to wait for Samuel. A few minutes cost him. And those were details that God determined would cost him. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, that little detail is described in this way. In answer to it, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And to hearken to the fat of rams. Oh, but I was sacrificing. I was doing such a godly thing. No, you weren't. You were in the midst of disobeying what you were told to do. And it doesn't matter what else went with it. 
You don't it get the benefit of saying I'm I'm teaching the lost and therefore it's okay for me to lie to them. It doesn't work that way. We don't get excused ungodly behavior because we kind of throw a little godliness in there. That messes it all up. That one word, not, remember in Genesis 3 verse 6, it changed everything. Now think about several examples of how this played off beyond Saul. Absalom usurped the authority of his own father, David, who was on the throne. How did he do it? He played politics. Manipulated the people, it says in 2 Samuel 15, 3 through 6. The people coming in for judgment, what did the king say? He sits outside the gates, they come, he says, and he's always got the answer. It's a really great politician. He tells them exactly what they want to hear. Well, yeah, everybody loves Absalom, and he stole away the hearts of the people, it said. For what? For the throne. He even set up a pillar in his own honor, as 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 18 says, and he paid the price for it. Verse 15, because he died. Adonijah, another brother, did the same thing after him with the same kind of consequences ultimately in 1 Kings chapter 1, 13 through 17. He wanted the throne. What? What do you mean Solomon's supposed to be on the throne? I can get this. Instead of submitting to what God had said he wanted, me, I want to be able to go in and get it for myself. Whenever you set up a church or any kind of religious group on your own, you are just doing what Absalom and Adonijah were doing. You're trying to run in and grab the power to have your own little group of people. And it may be running into the thousands nowadays. And you may have a television audience. And you may be able to hold up your Bible. And you may also seem never to have read it. Joel Olstein. And yet people today seem to have no problem usurping the authority of Christ. Because they want to justify their own power grab. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Solomon, you will remember, allowed the influence of his ungodly wives to matter more than the influence of Jehovah God. Now, are you listening to me, people? He let the influence of those closest to him take over the influence of the one who should have been the closest to him. And it cost him ultimately in the kingdom leaving. It cost his family. 1 Kings 11 verses 1 through 8. He was rich. Richest man on earth. He was powerful. At that time, the most powerful man on earth. That was about him. He started off so well. He had wisdom and he didn't use wisdom. Because of influence. We can focus so much then on worldly achievements and what we get that we lose sight of the one thing that really matters. Go through some time and create a resume. Now you have to do this, you're going to change jobs or whatever, you create a resume. All right, we've got a resume up there, but how much of that resume we got? I know you're not going to put on there faithful Christian at the top of your resume when you're applying to some worldly organization. But isn't that what ought to be at the top? This is who I am. This is what me, makes me do the things I do. This is what makes me a good employee. This is my great achievement. What do we want to be when we die? Do we want a list of all our things we accomplished? And what do they matter if we're not going to heaven? Matthew 16, verse 26. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jeroboam had a God-given opportunity. Sometimes we forget that. God-given opportunity to rule. And he squandered it by corrupting worship in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 32 and 33. And his children paid a price for it. He could have had those northern tribes and let them go down to Jerusalem and worship, but rather than recognizing God had given him in that first place and trusting God, he had to have the power. He couldn't give it up to God and trust that situation. 
And that's why you have to understand you can't try to get into a control mode when it comes to the church. You stay in faith mode, meaning you do what God says, and you keep it there. You don't control people, you persuade people. You don't try to manipulate people. You encourage, teach, and exhort people. It's the difference between doing it for God and doing it for yourself. And it's a big difference. God is spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Don't corrupt that. Ahab took it another step further. You see, we don't always realize what's going through in that northern kingdom. Now they're just they're worshiping those golden calves of Dan and Bethel, but they're calling it Jehovah. You see, they've gone back down to, to Exodus 32. We revived that. Ahab comes on the scene because of Jezebel. We just don't even worry about that. We're going to introduce a new God entirely. That's where Baal all of a sudden becomes their chief God. Full apostasy, 1 Kings 16, 30, and 34. The whole nation paid a price for that in going into captivity. And that's what happens to the church too if we allow ourselves to follow men rather than God. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. The kings that followed them after that, they had ample opportunity to correct these problems. Now, I want you to think about this in application. We do not have an excuse. You say, well, this is, how it's, this is how it's always been done. This is what we grow up doing. This is what mom and dad did. That's what got the rest of the people that followed into trouble because they were following what mom and dad did. Their kings followed their fathers after them, the tradition, instead of following God. They had an opportunity to correct it, but 2 Kings 23 verse 37 says they followed their fathers. In vain do they worship me, teach it for doctrines and commandments of men. Matthew chapter 15 verse 9. And so the history of Israel began with God's deliverance of Israel from an idolatrous nation in Egypt and ended with God delivering them over to another idolatrous nation, Babylon, because they'd become idolatrous. Now it started with the northern tribes with Assyria, again, idolatrous. And that's sad because it was completely unnecessary. So think about what all of these things share in common. All of them attempted to move authority away from the spiritual hand of God and place it instead into the secular hands of society. Every single thing I just mentioned. And that is precisely what people are doing today. We're going to move what's right and wrong and that's government's job. What you can do in worship, and it's government's job. How are we going to do this, and who should have control of this, and it's the government's job. And all of a sudden, now this is not a political speech. I'm saying that's what happens when you take things that belong to God and head over to men. You end up with a mess. And you end up with men who don't even know God. Thirdly, the corruption of the throne has confused the masses. Now this takes us back to the Jews and how they saw the throne. You know, the reign of David established a dynasty that the Lord promised would last forever in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 13 through 16. He emphasizes that again in Psalm 132. However, like so many things, Israel interpreted that prophecy, that promise, politically rather than spiritually. Now keep that in mind because of how many times we'll look at the Bible and we'll be concerned about the politics and not the spirituality of it. We will look at how this benefits me in life, in this life now, and not about how it applies to the church and my spiritual life in eternity. So future kings that followed David, they assumed, because they had this political understanding of it, that they had a God-given right to rule while failing to give God the glory by their rule. Why? Because they assumed that they were on the throne and God had abdicated His. And He hadn't. First Kings chapter 22 and verse 19, Micaiah is prophesying, he talks about the Lord is on His throne. The continuation of that earthly throne was always contingent on their obedience. That was acknowledged in 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 4 by Solomon, the first one. And so he acknowledged this again as he is establishing the temple and the worship there in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 25. But this is what we need to remember when we're throwing 
these things down and looking back at the throne. God tied his eternal design for the throne. Now we're back to Sunday night to the eternal design for the seed. Remember in 1 Chronicles 17, verses 11 through 14, he tied those two things together, that they were one and the same. The kingly line that came through Solomon was just a means to an end. It was not the end itself. It wasn't about Israel. It wasn't about Jerusalem. It wasn't about having a man on a literal throne on this earth. It never was about that. And that confused a lot of people because that's all they knew. The people wanted a throne in which they could exalt themselves. Remember in Isaiah 14 verse 13, it's speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, and that is what he is accused of. The king of Babylon, what's he doing? He's exalting himself. In Daniel chapter 4, you see that going on. Now this is in prophecy in the nature of the problem. But God has given a king to which we must submit ourselves. The people wanted the lineage of David. That's what matters. The Lord promised the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, 6, and 7. Big difference. The people wanted a temporal kingdom, one for this world, but God promised an eternal throne, Psalm 45, verse 61. Daniel chapter 2, and verse 44. The people attempted to make a priest into a king during the intertestamental period. Maybe you didn't know that. They saw this come together, but they failed to see the implications. Why? Because you can't have that with the old law. God promised a king who would be a priest in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. And he intended everything that came with it, as you read in Hebrews chapter 5 through 8, that there would be a king and who would become priest. And that meant that there would be a new law because he would also be a new covenant giver like Moses. And therefore the old one would be nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. It's Psalm 89. Ezra the Ezraite looks back, Ethan the Ezraite, excuse me, looks back to the promise of David in verse 4. The father and son relationship described in verses 26 to 29 in anticipation of an eternal throne, verse 36. But within that psalm, here's what we find. The captivity confused them. Wait a minute! There's not a throne now. That's verses 40 through 46. And therefore, Ethan couldn't figure out how this fit into God's plan as he ended that psalm through verse 52. It confused them. What is happening? But it did fit perfectly. What God wanted for the throne, Judah lost the throne because they were not using the throne for the purposes God made the throne. God always keeps His promises, as Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 17 to 21 point out. But His plan was not to put a king on the throne in Jerusalem, but to install ultimately His Son on His throne in heaven. So many people are confused about that. Why? Because they cling and they look to the throne the same way the Jews did of old. And because they look at it the way the Jews did, in a physical way, they cannot appreciate the spiritual reign. In the days of the Maccabees, the Jews asserted themselves in the search of a new king and a new kingdom. And it was all for naught. In the first century, the Jews were looking for the Messiah and His kingdom because they understood to some degree the book of Daniel. They knew the timing was right. And they were looking for a king, but they were looking for the wrong kind of king. You read in Daniel chapter 7, 9-14, through 14, that's a divine king. And that's not what they wanted. People to this day are still looking for an earthly kingdom. Why? Because they have earthly aspirations. They want everything fixed here. This is not what matters, friends. They wanted Jesus to be an earthly king. They were all in for that. Some of them, not the Jewish leaders, but many of the people were. Why? Because you get so consumed with your personal preference. Here's what I want out of this. And you get down what you want and you make that your priority. It means you end up not being willing to accept what God promises. Which is far better. You throw a fit because you're not getting what God wants or what you want out of the deal. So you want to accept the better deal. 
So think about this and keep it in mind when it comes to who's on your throne. It isn't about what you want the Bible to say. It's about what God has already said. Until we get down and accept it completely and entirely, we're going to make all the same type of mistakes that the Jews did, and we end up rejecting Jesus too, just like they did. John 1, verse 10 and 11, He came into His own, and His own received Him not. They had the King in their midst. They wanted nothing to do with Him. Why? Because they didn't understand the throne. Fourthly, the heir of the throne now reigns in righteousness. Jesus was always the one to whom God promised the throne and to whom all these promises apply. This is what Mary recognized in Luke chapter 1, 31 through 33. And you go through, or, the, or rather the, the nature of the prophecy that is there. And so you go through and you think about what he was from the very beginning, God's plan for Jesus. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. He shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. That's what she was told. Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies. And therefore he sits on David's throne even now. In Psalm 16 verses 8 through 13. He was raised from the dead specifically to sit on that throne. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 30 through 33, Peter says that's exactly what God planned. This Jesus whom you have crucified then, verse 36, He hath made both Lord and Christ. He has the authority. He is who He claimed to be. The Scriptures prove it. Jesus reigns on the throne in heaven and He rules with righteousness. Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, 8 and 9. But because He's on the throne, not in Jerusalem, and He's not going back to Jerusalem either. Why would He go back to Jerusalem when He's already in heaven? That'd be a demotion. Does everyone appreciate that? Because He is on the throne... That means we owe Him our attention to actually listen to His will instead of trying to impose our own. That's the force of Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The will has been established, it's been set, and it comes down from above. You go back in Matthew chapter 16. Peter has just recognized Jesus for who he is. Thou art the Christ, the one who fulfills all those prophecies. The Son of the living God. What's he saying? You have all authority. You are the one who is going to reign. Jesus says to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Where is this stand? And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be, having been bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be, having been loosed in heaven. He's looking to the future for the time he will be reigning as the king in his kingdom, on the throne in heaven. And he has said his will. If you don't listen to it, you're rejecting the king. We owe him because he's on the throne, our trust. Because he's done everything to earn it. I mean, you take a look at how he lived his life. What he submitted to, what he accepted, and what he was willing to do to go to the cross for us. And then when you see the victory of the resurrection, and God accepting him into heaven... What exactly is there about Jesus you can't trust? What is it you can't believe that He said He was and who He was and what He did? When He says, except that you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins, He was just stating a simple fact. Why? Because you need Him. You needed Him to die. 
You needed him to rise. You need him in heaven at this very moment. And you need to trust him. We owe him our will. And that's why we must humbly accept his. If we owe him giving our will to him, that means that whatever he says then for us, that's the exchange. That's what repentance is. We extract the selfishness of me in I decide. We set that aside, give it over to him. And in return, we accept his will in me. Except that you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Perish. A change of your mindset from the way you thought before to how you should think now. That's repentance. God's will, Christ's will first. We owe Him our allegiance as the one on the throne. And that needs to be stated loud and clear. And not in these superficial ways. And I remember every once in a while they get around and they'll be on a corner and it's like, it's like, honk if you love Jesus. You know, I found a lot of things in the Bible and that's not in there. He expects a whole lot more than honking a horn, doesn't he? Your allegiance, you want to show you love him? Do what he says to do. John 14, verse 15. When a new emperor came to the throne... And this began and was the means by which Augustus consolidated power. The soldiers in the Roman army would announce their loyalty to the new man by saying, Hail Caesar! And we, with every ounce of our being, should announce the reign of our king even more clearly. Hail Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, King, Savior. Because if we will not confess and acknowledge all that He has done, Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33, why would we expect Him to recognize us in heaven? Do you want to be someone, you know, it's one of those things you have a friend and you haven't seen him in years, right everybody? Hi. That they don't ever, you don't ever hear from them until all of a sudden you make a bunch of money and now that they're your greatest friend and don't you remember everything and how they, oh yeah, I've never forgotten about you. I just lost touch. Those people. You got the people you went to high school with and all of a sudden those sport, you're a sports celebrity. You got millions of dollars running in and everybody's your friend. I think that's kind of how people think on Judgment Day it's going to be. And they're going to be running to Jesus. Oh yeah, I'm your friend. Where were you when times were hard and people cursed me in your presence and you stayed silent? Hail Jesus, King of my life. And therefore, we owe him our love and appreciation, respect. We love him because he first loved us, 1 John 4, verse 19. And because of this, we owe him our submission. Because we love him. Because we need him. And because we appeal to him for everything. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience for the things which he suffered. And being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation and all that obey Him. We can't say He doesn't know what it's like to have to obey. And that's why in John 14, verse 15, He says, If you love Me, keep My commandments. That's why in Acts 2, verse 38, Peter then, after they acknowledged and he pointed out who this is, they said, well, what do we do then? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, you have killed your king. And he hasn't given up on you. He'll still take you back. How? How? Tell me how. Be baptized. 
and we have a world full of people saying, well, I can't do that, then don't call him king. If you're not going to do what he tells you to do, you're not in that kingdom. You're still living in your own. A proud, haughty world where Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We owe him our faithfulness so that no matter what else may happen, no matter how much pressure his enemies may exert on us, we're going to stand with the king. That's what it says. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Are times hard? Yeah. Is it uncomfortable a little bit, just a little bit, to be a Christian sometimes? Why? Because you can't always shop places because of they're doing silly things. We think that's bad. We have to pay extra taxes because of being honest, and we think that's bad. And there are people who are in danger of their lives to this day in some parts of the world because they will not be quiet about Jesus and that he is king. We owe him everything for a very simple reason. We owe him everything because without him, we are nothing. When you realize that, you'll love your king. I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And yet, though we are nothing, he offers us everything. Revelation 3, verse 21. A crown. He is the king, and he's offering you a crown. There is a king on the throne, and his name is Jesus. We may fail to submit, but that will not change the fact that he reigns, that he rules, and that he will judge. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. You cannot escape it. The story of Old Testament history, it's the story of the throne. If looked at solely through the eyes of Judaism, it's a sad story indeed. Wanting the wrong kind of throne, ultimately getting a throne, and then carelessly tossing away the throne. It's the story of the seduction of power, the consolidation of power, the corruption of power. Why? All because they did not submit to the one who truly has power. That's why. Throughout their history, Israel kept looking for someone to lead them, someone to deliver them, and someone to reign over them. But they already had a king. And what we sometimes fail to realize is that when the Lord had the Israelites construct the Ark of the Covenant, guarded by the cherubim, just as in the Garden of Eden, and he placed the mercy seat on top. A box, a simple box, except it's gold. And there are these creatures on each side coming around with their wings. And there is a seat. And that made it essentially a throne. It likely looked far more like one than we ever have really appreciated. Therefore, when the Israelites called for a king, they were dethroning God to put a man in his place. And this is so typical about what men do in religion and life. Jesus is on the throne and they want to kick him off so that they can make the decisions. Rather than accepting divine authority, men want to replace it with something that pleases them rather than pleasing God. It may be worship. I want to make worship how I want to. We'll have a vote. And we'll have a vote about how, how we do the Lord's Supper. I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of quaint and everything, but we can be unique. We can offer not just grape juice, but grapes. 
That'd be different. Oh, I know it's been done. We can put money under the seat. Let a few people know and announce it. And all of a sudden, everyone will want to come. We can throw a party. Entertain the kids. Talk in generalities. Build in. Bring in the people. Build up nice buildings. And we can do that. As long as God's not on that throne. But when Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, there he entered, remember, the true holy of holies. Taking his blood before the Father's throne. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. And then turning and sitting down next to him at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, which by the way goes back to Psalm 16. To reign as king of his kingdom, having received all authority, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 says, not only to reign, but also to rule. And it's because of this that the writer of Hebrews was able to say in Hebrews 4 verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the new mercy seat. It is not in Jerusalem. It is in the very presence of God. The story of the throne is long and complex, but today the king of kings sits on the throne and he calls for us to be part of his kingdom by submitting to his reign. You see, there is somebody on the throne in your life. Someone is in charge determining what you do. Who justifies and says this is the right thing to do. Who makes it okay for you to live as you live. To worship as you worship. To attend as you attend. To decide what you decide. Someone has to be there. And if you're a Christian, it better be Jesus. If you want to go to heaven, it better be Jesus. If you want to have hope and peace and comfort, you need to submit to Jesus. He came to provide the best life because he knows how that works. The only one who has made it to heaven, heaven on his own is Jesus. He knows how it's done. The only one who can make it possible for us to get to heaven is Jesus. Why would we submit to anybody else? He's told us what to do. He's given us the kingdom. And what a glory it is. It is simply based on all people who will actually submit and continually submit to his will. No borders, not upon this earth. Doesn't matter where you are, because it's a spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, John 18, verse 36. The question is, does that rule extend into your heart? You will notice it's not just about whether Jesus was king of you when you were baptized. Because that was about saying, I want you as king. The rest of life is telling everyone else, Jesus is my king. It's amazing how easy it is to identify an American anywhere else in the world by the way he acts. It ought to be true that anywhere in the world, including in America, people will know that Jesus is your king by the way you behave. And if that's not true for you, then who's really on the throne? You need to get Jesus back there. And you can do that if you need to. And come while we stand and sing.